Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Bell Global, Hunger as a Weapon, Humanitarian Access for Aid Deliveries to Gaza. I hope that you can see me. If you prefer to listen in English, please stay in this channel. For translation into German, please click on the globe button. Guten Abend und willkommen. Wenn Sie dieser Diskussion in Deutsch zuhören möchten, klicken Sie bitte auf den... In German, please press to the button. Leila is a leader. Bell Global is a series that brings together experts internationally and in Germany to discuss current issues. Today, we want to speak about a serious and urgent topic, the famine in Gaza and humanitarian access. We are very pleased and honored to have Michael Fachri, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food and Professor at, um, of Law at Oregon University, as well as Luisa Amtsberg, Federal Government Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance, Shana Lowe, Communications Advisor at the Norwegian Refugee Council, and René Wildangel, historian and publicist. You can find more information about our panelists in the chat. Briefly about the procedure, I will first ask our guests a few questions myself and after an hour open up for questions from the audience, please write your questions in the Q&A. Um, just a few introductory words in advance. On March 25, uh, the UN Security Council passed a resolution on Gaza. It calls for an immediate ceasefire for the duration of the month of Ramadan, the immediate and unconditional release of the remaining over 100 hostages, and the urgent expansion of humanitarian aid delivery to Gaza. Ramadan ended yesterday. The fighting continues, the fate of the hostages remains uncertain, and the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip after six months of war and widespread destruction is becoming more catastrophic by the day. 5% of the population have been killed or injured by Israeli military strikes. The majority of the population no longer have a roof over their heads and have been forced to flee. This includes the staff of our partner organizations in Gaza. Due to the military closure following the terrorist attacks by Hamas on October 7th, the entire population is dependent on humanitarian aid and affected by famine. Dozens have already died of hunger, including around 30 children. As early as December last year, Human Rights Watch warned of the starvation of the civilian population in Gaza as a weapon of war. The Israeli military controls all imports into Gaza, including those coming from Egypt, citing security reasons. Um, despite an order from the International Court of Justice following South Africa's genocide lawsuit against Israel to improve supplies to the civilian population, and despite appeals from Washington, Berlin, and Brussels, only a fifth of the required aid is reportedly currently reaching the Gaza Strip. This is mainly due to Israel's restrictions on deliveries, but also to, due to the lack of security for aid organizations operating in the Gaza Strip. Some organizations have stopped their deliveries entirely following the drone attacks on the World Central Kitchen Convoy on April 1st. Last week, the US government increased its pressure on Premier Netanyahu and apparently also brought a suspension of uh, arms deliveries into play. The Israeli government responded with some swift concessions. Um, the Erez border crossing in the north is to be temporarily opened for aid deliveries and a number of bakeries in the Gaza Strip were once again given permission to operate. It was also announced to allow more aid deliveries through Kerem Shalom in South Israel and the Ashdod port north of the Gaza Strip. The German foreign ministry tweeted that it had worked towards these access points and expects fast action. Uh, now, I would like to start with um, Shana, as you work for an organization operating on the ground. After these announcements have been made, have your colleagues and perhaps also other organizations uh, already noticed some improvements on the ground? Can you see, feel the difference? Thanks. Thank you, Leila, for, for hosting. In terms of the difference on the ground, it's not going, we're not even with a, a slight increase in aid um, over the last few days, we're not going to see any impacts 
happen immediately because the situation is so dire. In terms of the eras crossing, we haven't seen any goods come through there. My understanding is that there have been some goods that have been screened there, but have not been allowed to enter yet. Uh, and and I have, pardon me, I have some notes here um, around some of the, the figures of aid that have come through that are not from the UN, but rather actually reported by COGAT, the Israeli military's wing that coordinates humanitarian affairs affairs uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory. And so according to Kogat's website, between the 7th of October and yesterday, the 10th of April, 299,010 tons of food were provided. This equates to an average of 1,607 tons per day uh, over 80, 186 days. In 2008, when, is, when Gaza's population was around one and a half million, they required uh, around 2,571 2, tons of food daily, according to Israel's own calculations. And so considering today's population, which is uh, approaching 2.3 million people, uh, and factoring in population growth, this, this suggests that around 3,984 uh, or 85 tons of food must be provided daily. So at best, Israel has a, has provided approximately 40% of the needed food required in Gaza over the past 186 days. Even yesterday, Israel inspected and transferred 3,885 tons of food, which still falls short by 100 tons of the minimum amount required. So even as we're seeing these, these increases, they still aren't meeting the, the minimum threshold of aid that's needed. On top of that, we're still facing delays, both because of Israeli screening processes, as well as the just the logistical challenges um, uh, of getting through the pipeline in Egypt. So it's going to take a very long time of persistent uh, scaling up of aid in order for any any effect to really be felt on the ground. Now, uh, the United States together with other countries uh, such as Germany, France, etc., have started um, uh, weeks ago already with airdrops and also um, shipments by sea. Now, these airdrops have been criticized by humanitarian organizations as not being effective, as being too expensive, as actually being dangerous for the people who seek um, help. Can you maybe describe a little bit, do they do any good or um, are they actually an addition to the dire situation or how do you assess these drops? Well, of course, any amount of aid entering Gaza compared to no aid entering Gaza is, is important and needed. But in terms of the impact that it's making, the amount of aid that's coming through these airdrops is just a fraction of what's actually needed on the ground. And um, and and are often seen as a, I think, a distraction and made to to make the countries that are participating uh, feel like they're able to do something when it would be much more effective if those countries exerted their political power to to pressure Israel to open the crossings, uh, the ground crossings, which is a much more efficient way of delivering aid, and and scale up the amount of aid that's going through those crossings. In terms of the dangers that we've seen with the airdrops. We've seen parachutes fail to properly deploy and aid actually land on people and crush them. We've seen aid land in the Mediterranean Sea and, and desperate people seeking assistance have actually drowned after getting tangled up in the parachutes. We've seen aid not only land in the sea, um, but also be blown into Israel. And so it's very difficult in such a densely populated area to be able to act, to, to safely deploy um, and drop and and drop this this assistance. On top of that, uh, and we've seen in the videos that the the scramble uh, to to get to that aid is is chaotic, and it means that some of the most vulnerable people in Gaza who are in desperate need of that aid, uh, females and female led households, uh, the elderly, people with disabilities, they're not able to participate in that in that scramble and they're being excluded and are, and are often forced to, to purchase the aid um, when it's being resold by those that have been able to access it. So some of the most vulnerable people aren't able to get it. We as humanitarian agencies 
are expected to um, do due diligence to ensure that our aid isn't being diverted and to ensure that it's reaching the people who need it the most. And when you're dropping aid from the sky, you just don't have, simply don't have those assurances to, to ensure that that aid isn't being diverted or that it's ending up in the hands of the most vulnerable. And so that's another challenge. By far, the easiest way to, to provide aid is through the crossings that already exist. The Karim Shalom crossing prior to October 7th was processing 500 trucks per working day and, and has the capacity to process 1,000 trucks per working day. It still isn't reaching anywhere near those figures. Um, and, and that would be, and there are, are kilometers and kilometers of trucks, aid trucks lined up in Egypt just waiting to enter. In terms of um, delivering aid by sea, that certainly the sea corridor is certainly something that that can be useful and helpful, but it in no way is a substitute for the land crossings. And as we've seen with the, the American plan to build this pop-up uh, pier to deliver aid, it still hasn't been uh, completed. And that was announced um, weeks and weeks ago. And so it's something that takes a long period of time. And we already know that there are ways safer ways, easier ways, more cost-efficient ways to deliver aid through the land crossings that already exist. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the crossings in the north? Now, it was announced to open Eris, but uh, we also read reports that actually uh, food trucks are uh, allowed in or at a much lower rate than through other crossings. Um, although the situation in the north is especially dire and um, I mean, the north is the area where the Israeli army was in charge for a long time now. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the situation in the north and why it's so dire there? Sure. Well, the north has effectively been cut off from southern Gaza since very early on in the in the hostilities. Since, and it was on October 13th, uh, less than a week in that Israel made an announcement calling on all, uh, a directive calling on all Palestinians leave, living in northern Gaza to, to flee to the south um, without providing, of course, safe evacuation routes, safe places for people to seek shelter. And for many people, leaving from, from the north was just not feasible, either because they were fearful about the conditions in the south and not having a place to sleep, because people um, have disabilities or family members with disabilities who are unable to make the journey. And so there are still hundreds of thousands of people remaining in northern Gaza who've been effectively severed from the south for six months, about six months now. And, and that's where the desperation um, has really increased. The aid has almost entirely entered Gaza from the south, from um, Rafa and the Karim Shalom crossing, um, both of which are in the southernmost part of Gaza. And so even for that aid to reach northern Gaza requires a lot of coordination and the ability to get trucks from the south all the way up to the north. And you have to remember that you have people who are desperate throughout all of Gaza. The most desperate, of course, are in northern Gaza, but it's very difficult for convoys to make their way from south to north, um, passing through crowded streets, with with thousands of desperate people, tens of thousands of desperate people, and be able to complete a complete convoy. On top of that, in terms of accessing the North, that requires a, a, a greater level of coordination with the Israeli authorities to ensure that, that uh, aid trucks are able to reach there. And so, uh, whereas in the, in the South, typically the way that, that, uh, that aid is delivered is that they will note aid agencies will notify uh, the the COGAT, the Israeli branch of the military that coordinates humanitarian affairs, and let them know where they're going and what they're doing, and then they'll wait to get a, a confirmation that that message has been received. Um, obviously, we've seen in cases, as we saw with World Central Kitchen last week, that that isn't always. Uh, a reliable way of ensuring that the safety of aid workers. But in terms of reaching the North, it requires a, a greater level of coordination where aid agencies need to um, actually get approval from the Israelis to cross through Israeli administered checkpoints and be able to go to the North. And so oftentimes those, um, those requests are flat out denied or ignored and not responded to 
or the conditions on the ground are such that they aren't able to complete those missions. And so this has led to, to just a fraction of the aid that's been attempted to reach the north uh, from getting there. Uh, because Israel completely controls the north, uh, it, it's, it, it requires um, this level of coordination beyond just a, a notification system. Um, in yeah. terms of the crossings, in terms of the crossings from the north, there is one crossing that that was opened in the last couple of months and used sparingly, primarily by food actors. Um, and and that crossing is a military road that bisects the north and the south that's mostly used for military supply routes. And um, and it hasn't been used to the extent that the that aid agencies would like. Some of the challenges there are that those aid deliveries, the dr truck drivers actually require uh, approval by Israeli authorities. They need to be vetted. And so there's even a shortage of truck drivers who are authorized to be able to, to drive along that route in order to be able to bring aid in. And as I mentioned um, earlier on, we simply just have not seen the ERA's crossing operational um, despite the assurances that were made in the last week. And so no aid has has actually come in through there. And all aid is either coming fr from the south of Gaza and making its way up to the north or through this military uh, access road that the Israelis created uh, over the last few months. Just very briefly on um, World Central Kitchen and um, the attacks um, on their convoy. Um Now, even before, two, about 200 uh, humanitarian aid workers, Palestinian aid workers, have been killed. Um, are aid workers actually still willing to take the risks on the ground? Well, many aid agencies continue to operate. There have been some that have suspended their operations, like World Central Kitchen. Uh, ANIRA was another organization that announced the suspension of, of activities. Um, and we've seen in other cases, even two months ago, UNRWA suspended operations to northern Gaza for a period of time after one of their convoys was struck by a, a, um, a shell fire, uh, fire, fired by a, a, um, a Navy boat. And so we've seen over this period of time that humanitarians are not safe. Uh, and and that's, that is in line with the fact that there simply is no safe place in Gaza for civilians or humanitarians. And we've seen um, protected persons, not only ordinary civilians, but doctors and, and rescue crews and humanitarians be attacked at unprecedented levels over the last six months. Uh, we at NRC are, as of now, committed to staying in Gaza and continuing to operate as best as we can. We are constantly reassessing the security situation to ensure the safety of not just our local staff, but also the seven or eight international staff that we have in, uh, in Gaza at any given time. There are certain precautions that we have to take such as ensuring that none of our movements are happening uh, after dark, for example, making sure that we're following very carefully where um, where hostility, active hostilities are taking place and making sure we're avoiding those. Um, and so in, in some ways, I think that the World Central Kitchen, of course, that was a shocking incident, particularly given how close the World Central Kitchen had been coordinating bilaterally Not, not through the UN systems, but actually bilaterally with um, COGAT. Um, but we, we saw that not as, as an ab aberration, but something that was in line with the insecurity that humanitarians had been facing over the last six months. The, the, really, the distinguishing feature here was the fact that six of the seven uh, aid workers killed during that incident happened to have foreign passports. But this was something that we've seen um, and, and expect to continue to see unless the situation uh, dramatically changes. Thank you, Shayna. I think you and your colleagues must be commended for your work. Uh, I would like to move on to Michael. And you're, of course, all welcome to switch on your cameras. I'm sorry, I didn't want to keep all of you in the dark. Uh, at the core of your work is the right to food. Um, and even before October 7th, um, 80% of the Gazan population was dependent on humanitarian aid due to, to the 17-year uh, blockade. So um, 
I guess what we are interested in is what the long term effect of such a prolonged blockade are uh, on a population, on a society, and who is affected most when it comes to such a violent conflict situation such as now. Yeah, thank you, Leila. And um, yeah, I really appreciate how how you framed the question, which is it's important to under to have a little bit of historical context. And I know Renee will provide even more context um, to, and then to understand the future and to understand what's going on right now. So Israel has been um, controlling the food system in Gaza for decades. And then the most acute moment was, as you said, in 2007, when they began a blockade. So already it's a 17-year-old blockade. And what the government of Israel would do is they were counting calories. They ensured that the bare minimum amount of calories, not even good food, quality food, nutritious food, which is one's human right, but just basic calories were able to enter um, into Gaza so as not to raise international alarms around starvation. So it was on this... Uh, it was a very uh, cynical system of calculation. On October 8th, the government of Israel announced its starvation campaign. It announced, its government officials announced that they will deny the entry of food, fuel, water, and medicine from the very beginning of this war, and in fact did so. So they cut off, and, with a, with, and to build on the conversation with Shena, and they focused on cutting off uh, the north, um, as much as possible. So they um, they cut out, they they stopped the flow of all water into Gaza, uh, which, uh, and people in Gaza, I think, rely about 75% of their water to come from outside of Gaza. And then when they, they allowed water to flow back in, they only allowed water to flow back in into central and southern Gaza and not into the north. Um, so again, to put it in context, for 17 years, Israel has a chokehold on Gaza, res uh, restricting the, the amount of food, uh, water, and fuel that goes in. And then when the wa war starts, they squeeze, uh, creating conditions, which is, uh, we immediately raise the alarm, uh, me and other mandate holders, in the third by the third week of October, we said there's a risk of genocide. We, were make, we, we did this in public, uh, in, in our press releases. We did it in person at the General Assembly in Rome at the UN Committee on World Food Security. And I had bilateral conversations with multiple governments in October, including the German government, raising the alarm, providing context, making myself available to have those conversations. And then we saw it. We saw come January, uh, predictably and preventably, we saw in January, uh, not just from the uh, uh, reports by um, what's called the IPC, which is the international uh, agency that, that measures famine but we saw it once you start seeing children dying from malnutrition which is what we saw in january that's how you know that you're now sliding into famine and let me be clear starvation and famine never happens naturally even if there's a drought or weather conditions famine and starvation is always the result of political choices it always has been historically and 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 remains so today and the effects to, to, to your question more directly, there's the effects immediately on the individual and there's social effects. So we saw evidence of stunting and the risk of stunting in children early on uh, in the first weeks of the war. Um, uh, and, and so what that meant is that there are children who are not under the age of five that are not receiving adequate nutrition uh, have the risk of permanent cognitive and physical impairment into the future. Also, when a, when a community experiences uh, famine and starvation, there's research that shows that, that uh, the, the, bio, the biological effects actually carry on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll add the social trauma. The social trauma of starvation echoes into the future for generations, just as it has in Ireland when the British starved the Irish hundreds of years ago, just as it was in uh, uh, India and Bangladesh, and, and just as we see it in other communities. So what we're dealing with here now in terms of, of starvation, in the context of a genocide, let me be very clear here, is something that the international community is obliged to address 
not just a matter of development or, or reconstruction, but as reparations. Because what we're talking about is the most profound violation of human rights and, and international law. How is it how is it that we this this situation in Gaza, we've never seen a civilian population made to go hungry so completely and so quickly in any time in modern history? 2.3 Palestinians were made to go hungry almost instantaneously. And now we're in a situation where Israel is starving them as a campaign. They announced their starvation campaign. They implemented it. And now we're seeing the effects. And again, the reason is this is a context of, as we raise the alarm, there's a risk of genocide. As the International Court of Justice has said, there's a plausible case of genocide. And now we're seeing there's a plausible, we can argue, we can say realistically genocide is unfolding. This is the context. We're talking a context of apartheid. We're talking a context where Israel is occupying and has controlled the food system. And so you know, I'll end on this point. To build on Shana's focus, it's not just, so as Shana said, humanitarian aid has been restricted and denied. Um, convoys that have have given notice to the IDF have been bombarded, just to repeat what's been said. Civilians, when they're seeking aid, have been shot at repeatedly. They're not; These are not single instances. This has been repeated campaigns. And here's where I'll add, Israel has been destroying the food system itself in Gaza, making it impossible for people, in, uh, Palestinians in Gaza, to feed themselves and making it very difficult for them to feed themselves into the future. So they're destroying agricultural land, greenhouses, decimating fishing boats. Um, and so they're, they're consciously creating a long-term impact. So when it comes time to reconstruct and rebuild, we have to ask who is responsible. This, I mean, this is what a, a right to food perspective brings, is a question of who is doing what to whom, who is responsible. And in this case, I would say um, everyone, whether it's the Human Rights Council, the Security Council, the International Court of Justice, humanitarian workers, the human rights community, and people marching the streets, everyone is demanding a ceasefire. This is the main condition to allow, to end starvation and to end genocide. This is it. So who is responsible? Israel is responsible and its allies. Any country that is supplying, is militarily supporting Israel is complicit in genocide and starvation. Who are the main countries that provide military support to Israel? The United States and Germany. Therefore, they are responsible as a matter of reparations, not as a matter of creating, con adding conditions to development aid or charity work or any of that. It's an, uh, there will be an obligation. There is a, a time of reckoning. When the time of reckoning comes at the end of this war, it will be uh, on these terms. I think we will get into this with um, Luisa and René. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, the issue of genocide, the, the charge of genocide is being deliberated at the International Court of Justice. Um, now, Israel would certainly say that Hamas has also a part of the blame. Um, what does international law say about the responsibility of all parties in this conflict, uh, of Israel as the occupying power, but also of Hamas um, as, a, as a party to this conflict that um, with the attacks of, of 7th of October also has started this particular war in Gaza? Um, what does international law say about this? Um, and what is your assessment when it comes to the right of food um, regards to the responsibilities of all conflict actors? Also, maybe in relation to other uh, conflicts, if we don't rein this in at one point, what does it say to uh, conflict parties in, in, in other conflict regions uh, where famine comes up or is used um, as a you know, as a tactic of war. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Laila. That's such an important question. So first, just generally speaking in this particular world, all parties, all parties must comply with international law, international humanitarian law. So that means the targeting of civilians, the kidnapping of civilians violate the, the laws of war. This is very clear. Nevertheless, there is no exception to genocide. There's no excuse. There's no argument And even if one says, ah, it, it, it's too early to decide if there's genocide, which I think is not a strong argument, but even if one takes that position, there's a clear risk of genocide. This part, when the International Court of Justice says genocide is plausible, when uh, uh, 
dozens of special rapporteurs raised the alarm of the risk of genocide. There's an international obligation without exception for all states to do everything that they can to prevent genocide. There is no exception. There is no argument to that. Um, and and starvation, in, uh, I, I would argue, in, in the way international law is now, starvation violates, uh, the uh, is a war crime, but I think it's more fundamental than that. I think starvation violates, is a violation of international law at its core. Um, and so, and then to your other point that Israel is an occupying power. And so it, it there are certain, uh, when it says it has a right to defend itself, sure, a country has a right to defend itself. But this is, again, in the context of an occupation. It doesn't have the right to commit genocide. It does not have the right to kill civilians indiscriminately. It does not have the right to deny humanitarian aid under any conditions. Um, more broadly, this is, you know, we've seen the trend starting with uh, Somalia in 2011 and now. Time and time and time again, food is increasingly being used as a weapon. So I raised the alarm before the war in Gaza broke out two years ago at the General Assembly saying, I'm seeing food being used as a weapon of more, uh, at, incre- at an increasing rate with no accountability. And so if we keep allowing for this to happen, the way we've let this war go on too long, when I say we, this is in the international uh, institutions that can do something, government, states, um, people have been marching very quickly, but the more we allow this to happen, the less we hold uh, not just individuals, states accountable, uh, the more it's going to happen in the future. So this is what's a, an important distinction. International criminal law, when we say war crimes, the most that can happen is when the war ends, maybe the international criminal court, maybe a domestic a national court might hold certain individuals accountable, and maybe those individuals will be put into jail. Maybe. But that doesn't that doesn't address the structural issues, the longstanding issues. Um, whereas genocide holds an entire state responsible. Um, and what are the remedies? The remedies isn't just putting individuals for jail in jail. The remedy then becomes uh, uh, in the situation of genocide is recognizing the Palestinian people's right to self determination. This is why human rights matters and keeping it in, in a human rights framework. Um, that's the remedy. Um, available when we're talking about genocide, not just throw this person or that person into jail. Thank you, Michael. You've addressed Germany uh, directly. Now, Germany or the government of Germany has a very clear position that it is not aiding and abetting genocide. We could see that also in the last proceedings at the um, International Court of Justice. I would um, like to continue with you, Luise. Um, now, surely you would like to address also what Michael has said. Um, and what do you think does the German government do? It maintains that it supplies a lot of humanitarian aid to the Palestinians, um, that is um, taking care of international law. Um, could you maybe comment on that and also um, comment on, and, on what the German government uh, does about the threat of famine in Gaza? Yeah, thank you very much, Leila, um, and also to um, the panelists that we come together to discuss um, uh, these important issues that are in the most sensitive environment, I would say, um, for me personally, uh, politically very challenging, but still it is important to um, also hear from uh, from you, Shaina, from the ground uh, that is for us political decision makers very important. And uh, I can also um, highlight what uh, Leila has said uh, on, on the work the humanitarian workers are doing uh, in Gaza right now um, that is uh, not only respectful, but um, um, yeah, it is um, it is challenging and we, we must show our respect and also try everything to secure the work of the humanitarian workers. So, I mean, uh, to reflect a little bit on the government position. And I mean, there have been so many questions and uh, statements and, and points raised uh, here before, and I don't know if I can answer to all of it. But uh, to first of all, shed a light on what we are doing. Um, I want to stress, first of all, that we have been making, and this shows also the presence we are um, having in the region, that we've been making humanitarian assistance available directly um, to the Palestinian people for months. 
And to be honest, we also reflect on the situation before the 7th of October in Gaza. We also did it years before, um, since the situation uh, in Gaza was uh, dire before 7th of October and, and the war also. So we are working with international agency towards this goal. And it's rightfully uh, been said that um, the scale up of humanitarian assistance by the member, by the states is crucial uh, since what the work we have done in the past and also what um, um, the engagement of, of uh, various states was not enough and still is not enough. So Germany is the largest individual donor and um, this is not um, satisfying because it is still not enough. But um, to just uh, mention that we um, are now the largest individual donor um, of humanitarian assistance with over 200 million last year and um, so far uh, over 50 million this year. Just to give an impression of what it means also, um, uh, what measures and, and what um, responsibility has been taken, but still this is not enough. And um, this uh, Shaina uh, pointed out very clearly. So one week after the massacre of Hamas, um, our foreign minister declared that um, civilians need safe space where they can find protection and also um, where we can provide with essential goods or the humanitarian workers can do this. So what I mean to say is that these were our priorities from the very beginning. And I say this in a personal note. Um, it was not that easy to achieve that um, in our political environment to continue humanitarian assistance after 7th of October was politically challenging. And I'm very glad that the government and uh, especially the foreign minister never um, doubted the importance of humanitarian assistance. But to understand also the German debate, which is not only driven by the government, but also by the parliament, um, it must be said that it was very challenging and is still uh, until today. So we implemented um, humanitarian uh, assistance not um, only by our UNRWA, but also um, organizations like OCHA, the World Food Programme, ICRC, uh, and the German Red Cross, and um, increased yeah, the support um, threefold since uh, October. This also shows how important and how needed the assistance is, because we don't do that in a vacuum. It is like we need more, and we need also more donors and states to participate. Our focus is on providing food. Uh, and uh, emergency uh, accommodation and medicine, of course, um, baby food and um, psychosocial support. Um, I also highlight this because um, uh, it all happens in an environment where humanitarian assistance um, that is needed to provide for the people with the most pressuring things uh, is not nearly enough because we are now in a situation, and this must also be said, that um, it is not only like providing, but also um, to fight the spread of illnesses and um, destroyed civil infrastructure, which is even more challenging um, to um, to address that and also achieve um, that everyone is um, is addressed by humanitarian assistance. So we have the situation that uh, we negotiated uh, a lot about um, and also urged the Israeli government to scale up humanitarian assistance and open more border crossings um, led through commercial goods and all these uh, things also addressed by the NGOs. Um, we try to achieve that and um, Israel has announced to opening the Aras border crossing and also um, the Ashdod port for humanitarian aid and really there can't be any excuses anymore. It must happen now. And uh, the number of trucks that also been said is um, has increased, but it is not enough still. Um, so the danger of famine is still acute. And, and um, I think, and this is maybe also um, um, can be seen as an answer to um, what Mr. Fakhri said. Even though the government is not under the impression that um, the Israel Israeli government is intentionally or intending the starvation of the people in Gaza, it is still a fact that the humanitarian assistance is needed to prevent this from happening, prevent famine. And um, therefore, we address, of course, the Israeli government to prove that this is not intentionally and open up this hum uh, the humanitarian um, access and uh, crossings and let through more um, humanitarian assistance. Um, this is being said in an environment 
where I also have to state that questions on genocide and uh, starvations and um, accusations of war crimes are decided by courts. And in this um, uh, situation, I must say that is a good thing that independent um, judges and courts are deciding on that because it's not a political decision. And this is being really um, something that I want to stress it is a court decision. Therefore, we have um, our international law and system. And uh, we, of course, will always respect what um, decisions are made by the courts. So this is a very vivid debate and not answered or can't be answered at that point, since we have the international law and the decisions um, uh, on these questions. But um, to explain a little bit more the uh, German position um, for me as human rights commissioner, of course, I'm focusing on how much humanitarian assistance we can get into the Gaza Strip because every political question must be answered. But what is happening now or needed now is um, a, a massive scale up of humanitarian assistance. Um, I think from uh, also Michael's comments, it's visible that that um, Germany's position and also um, its commitment to human rights orientated foreign policy has kind of lost credibility internationally as being questioned, being criticized. I mean, how, Luisa, do you think it will be important or uh, what do you think the steps, apart from those that you've already outlined, have to be taken to kind of restore the trust and, and the credibility of human rights orientated foreign policy, even a feminist uh, foreign policy uh, was announced. Um, what would your take be on this? Well, uh, of course, uh, I already tried to answer the question a little bit um, uh, by uh, staying engaged and uh, being or uh, taking over responsibility when it comes to humanitarian aid. And I don't, um, I always have the feeling that um, uh, this is not seen as a political statement and this is maybe a very political view on, on the whole debate, but scaling up humanitarian assistance, urging the Israeli government to do more. It was uh, our foreign minister who in early December um, pointed out that the strategy, the war strategy is not preventing people from dying and it must be changed. So this is what we uh, in every way try to achieve and uh, we will continue to do that until um, uh, this is achieved and um, uh, I think in a way it answers your question that we will take over responsibility, we will always stay engaged and uh, try to use our influence but and this is also important of course um, and maybe not heard so much in the political debates we have um, we have, of course, the situation, it start, It doesn't start with uh, October, of course, because terrorist attacks have been um, there before and a very dire situation also. But what we also have to, to uh, point out in a debate like this is that the 7th of, of October, um, a terrorist attack that is really questioning the existence of is Israel and uh, threatening Israeli existence in a massive way. And I think we all can agree to this. We have to start from this point to also address Hamas and its role here. So the attacks left 1,200 people dead and thousands wounded. And I think it is also important to um, uh, uh, highlight this when it comes to a feminist foreign policy, that it has also been a massive attack on women and children um, uh, and um, uh, sexual violence that has happened uh, in, a, in a massive way. So starting from this, of course, and this explains a little bit the, um, the German positioning, um, Israel has the right to defend itself. So, and this must be clear, and this is government position. Um, and still we have constantly insisted that um, Israel in defending itself must, must do it its at most, it's at most um, to protect civilian lives and respect also the limits of self-defense um, uh, and international humanitarian law at all times. And in this very sensitive situation we are now in politically, and this is why we urge to um, uh, scale up humanitarian assistance and guarantee also um, the work of human um, humanitarian workers to uh, protect them in their work and also um, um, to 
yeah, um, achieve the, uh, how do you say, <laughs> sorry, now I'm, uh, I'm a little bit out of context because the question is uh, very, uh, very big, but to um, agree to a humanitarian ceasefire, to urge Israel to agree to a humanitarian um, ceasefire, and this with the belief that only an yeah, immediate humanitarian ceasefire will lead um, to a lasting, sustainable ceasefire. And this, also not being mentioned at this point, um, uh, is the only way, we are strongly the opinion that this is the only way to yeah, come to a yeah, or set ground for a peaceful two-state solution. And this is what the government is aiming for. Okay, thank you, Luisa. You're also welcome, of course, to kind of respond to each other, but maybe I, I go first to, to our last speaker, um, René, um, to maybe pick up on some points that Luisa mentioned, the difficult German context and also the concerns of the German public um, You've been quite critical of, of the public debate in Germany vis-a-vis -vis the war and how it's being conducted. It seems that um, due to the recent reporting on the famine, the, the debate has somewhat shifted. Um, do you believe it has shifted or do you think that there are still blind spots? Um, what is your assessment? Well, yes, I think it has uh, shifted in a way. You can see that at, if you look at polls, for example. But I certainly still do uh, see a lot of blind spots in, in the German discourse. And I think w the biggest uh, blind spot, if I think of our debate that we're just having, is um, is exactly that. I don't think the urgency of what is happening is really understood. I'm talking about policymakers, parliament, society, um, we have heard it now, and you said it in the beginning, 5% of Gazans have been killed or injured. I mean, it's, it's an incredible number. And we have heard the urgency in the words of Shana and, and Fahri with basically tens and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians being in danger and, and threatened. Their lives are in, in, in danger. And I also sometimes have the impression we're talking about a natural uh, catastrophe here. And, and, and Michael said that very clearly. Famine, uh, this is a man-made famine, and this is the consequence of political choices. And this is a, a blind spot we, because we're not uh, really um, debating this. We're having very polemic debates in Germany about the word genocide, but not about what this really means. Um, I can recommend to anyone to read the International Crisis Group report that came out on Monday. So the International Crisis Group is not exactly known as an um, organization that is particularly dramatic uh, in their words, usually. They're an analytic uh, think tank. So um, what they say very clearly to end this, we need to uh, first end the war, and then we need to step up humanitarian aid, and then we make to, uh, need to make sure that the aid actually reads uh, the people that uh, need it. And then I just quote the very last sentence of the report. It says, the alternative is grim. The depopulation of Gaza, not through displacement to Egypt, but through war-induced starvation. This is the International Crisis Group. So you, you can call it genocide or not, but it is very dramatic, and I don't say, think this is fully understo uh, understood how uh, big the need to action is. And there are other other blind spots. One one blind spot that I see from the be beginning is the lack of empathy um, in Germany, um, a lack of empathy with the suffering that we see in Gaza, um, a lack of recognition of the rights of the Gazan population. A lack of empathy also to a certain degree with the Israeli victims, uh, with the Israeli hostages. I think it is right to always mention them and not uh, forget them in these contexts. Um, and there has been solidarity with Israel, and that's good. But on the other hand, when, it's, uh, when people look at what is happening in Gaza, I always have the feeling solidarity with Palestinians is somewhat suspicious. So there is also a blind spot. What do we know about Gaza? What did we know about Gaza before 7th of October? Who are these people? And then you sometimes see very um, dangerous things in the public discourse when people equate Gaza's civilian population, 2.3 million people with Hamas, uh, as if they were all legitimate targets uh, in, these, uh, in, the, in, the, in this war. And uh, our standards and the so-called value-based uh, order and our uh, uh, standards of international law 
are going uh, downhill here very quickly and the collective punishment of the civilian population is simply being um, accepted. And uh, if I if I zoom out a little bit of the debate about famine, um, more generally speaking, I see a blind spot also when we talk about Israel. Because when we talk about Israel, um, from the beginning, the German government has said we show solidarity with Israel. I often wonder what do we mean when we say solidarity with Israel? Because I think it often means solidarity with this particular government, with the Netanyahu government, which is leading a devastating, this devastating war campaign with all the consequences that we have heard. And that is, by the way, not only harming and threatening the life of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and um, more than 33,000 have died already, but it's also very harmful to Israel. So I think that there's also a blind spot. Who do we talk about when we talk about solidarity with Israel? Because there are a lot of people in Israel that de deserve our solidarity from my point of view. And that is the human rights community. That is those people who still protest for peace, for an end to the war, who show solidarity with Palestinians. That's also something that I often see is forgotten. And um, allow me to mention one more, um, yeah, if you want to call it blind spot. If I just look at the German uh, discourse, um, and that was mentioned before, I, I don't think that many people in Germany understand how damaging this discourse that we're having in Germany is to Germany's credibility and Germany's standing in the world. And unfortunately, in the past six months, there are numerous examples um, for this. And I'm just mentioning one, um, the latest uh, disinvitation of Nancy Fraser, uh, one of the most important philosoph philosophers um, worldwide currently from the New School in, in New York City, and who was disinvited by uh, the University of Cologne, which is my university, because she signed a pro-Palestine um, declaration. And these claims and these disinvitations and this narrow discourse is often argued with uh, um, with, with so-called historic uh, sensitivity um, because somebody was critical towards Israel here. Well, I see the opposite of, of uh, historic uh, sensitivity here. Um, when a Jewish uh, critical scholar from the US is, is sidelined, is uh, silenced, and when this particular scholar is coming of all places from the New School, um, which has been a refuge for um, in, in, the, in the US during the Second World War, for refugees and uh, and uh, and thinkers uh, from Germany, so um, the de the debate and the general climate in Germany, unfortunately, um, yes, there are many blind spots. I think it's often very polemic. Um, I think there is a danger to academic freedom when we look at what has been happening, and I don't think it's also being fully understood here. Not only the consequences that that this war and this whole six months are having. Um, on Gaza and on Israel, but also on us and our debate here. Um, René, Luisa mentioned um, the funding to um, humanitarian aid organizations in Palestine. Now, uh, the funding to the Palestinian Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, has been particularly contested um, in Germany. Germany is continuing to fund UNRWA. Um, in the West Bank and the Arab states, but has suspended all new commitments for Gaza at the moment. Um, how do you assess this with regards to the famine, UNRWA being a very important um, relief actor in Gaza? And what do you think Germany should do? Well, I think stopping these particular funds is a disaster in the situation that we're in because UNRWA is the main actor and has been the main actor to support um, the Palestinian civilians uh, in the Gaza Strip, of course, long before the 7th of October. But in this uh, crisis uh, situation, they're especially um, important. And yes, we have seen those allegations and there is an is, uh, investigation going on. I mean, to my knowledge, there has no evidence ever been presented so far. And the, the end result is the funds for Gaza are still blocked. And that's bad because we need them right now. But maybe even worse than the funding. Funding is one thing. 
But again, Michael has said we're talking about political choices here. So I think it's even more important that Germany gets the political messaging right here. Um, in recent days, Israel has cut off UNRWA from uh, the north of Gaza. And we have just heard how dire the situation is there. So I would have expected the German government to comment on this. Apart from the funding issue, um, UNRWA has been vilified. Um, there's a systematic smear campaign. And as uh, uh, Luisa rightly mentioned, we are, as Germany, supporting UNRWA since decades. So we know these people. We have worked with them for decades. We have visited them all the time in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in the whole region. So if there are allegations and they're unproven, then I would expect to... Um, to hear something about it and uh, confront this kind of uh, delegitimation um, that has been going on. In general, I think Germany in this regard and in other regards should be more um, outspoken. And this event today is called um, Hunger as a Weapon. So this is not some political phrase. This is based in international law, as uh, others have pointed out here as well. So I would also like to hear uh, German politicians and the German government comment on this. And we have lots of comments when we talk about uh, Russia and their conduct in the way uh, the war of aggression against Ukraine. But we have uh, radio silence when we uh, talk about uh, the current um, events in Gaza. And then again, just briefly, political choices. So I think we the, the funding is fine and uh, everything that Louisa said I think is very important that, that uh, Germany um, continues. But we also heard about the inefficiency from Chain or for example, for the airdrops and, and Germany was taking part in this as well. So what we need desperately and the ICG report also underlines it is political leverage. And Germany has leverage over Israel and the US has leverage. So it's just not very credible if um, we are saying, well, we are doing everything we can to urge because Michael um, mentioned, of course, the arms trade. And I think you could argue at this point that uh, also under international laws and uh, treaties such as the um, arms trade treaty, that it is even illegal to send uh, weapons to Israel because we have allegations and mounting evidence that there uh, are uh, um, they are used for breaches of international law and in such instances um, you're not allowed to send these uh, weapons and um, there is political leverage and i think uh, germany has not uh, used it and again it's about urgency it's about uh, time running out it's about the death potentially of ten thousands and i'm very very worried that we are looking back at this moment in half a year, a year from now, and then everybody will ask, how could this happen? And that is, uh, that is the big problem. We need to act now. And I think it's not about, um, about uh, messaging. It's about asserting just the right amount of pressure to actually change the situation on the ground. But could you maybe just give a like, very brief example of, of how leverage could be used? I mean, it seems like, for example, a foreign minister language has, has kind of shown reflected that she's kind of pleading to to let more humanitarian aid in and it just hasn't happened for a long time so i mean what would the leverage points be on the israeli government at the moment well i mean i don't have a strategy ready here but the i think the leverage is there on all fronts um, Germany is one of the, and then the EU, EU even more so, is one of the strongest uh, economic partners of uh, of Israel. Um, I was talking about the arms uh, trade. So um, I think if you just urge and you send these messages again and again, and there are no consequences to your words, then it's just not very credible. And we see the same in the US, where yes, you can also find all these messages, but in fact, until today, um, the U.S. is sending all the aid and all the weapons. So um, I think we we just have to start to be more serious here and use the, again, political leverage that we have. And, uh, and there I come back to my point uh, about solidarity with Israel. I think this current course by this particular 
right-wing coalition is destructive also for um, Israel itself. So um, using the leverage and asserting pressure and really showing that we're willing to do uh, to do some real steps here would also um, be good for the country. Um, we have only half an hour left, and I would like to open for Q and A from the audience. Unless one of you would like to comment on each other, Michael, very if I can briefly, just if you like. very briefly to build on Renee's point in your last question, Leila, it's so interesting to me that you know if one waits for a court's final determination to decide what political action you would take. The world would be a disaster. That's not how law and politics works. There, uh, to understand what's going on, I'm given authority by the Human Rights Council as an expert to, per, to, uh, to make a judgment call, as are my colleagues. So what is the legal context? And then we bring it into what leverage can be taken. The International Court of Justice has said there's a plausible case of genocide. And in its most recent decision, they said there is starvation. They use the language of starvation in their decision. Mm -hmm. We know the Human Rights Council's most recent uh, resolution said, demanded for a ceasefire, as the Security Council has demanded for a ceasefire, and the Human Rights Council has also included a call for an arms embargo. Only when President Biden called Netanyahu recently, after the World Central Kitchen, after a U.S. ally was struck, and said and threatened and basically implied that he will no longer provide military and financial support to Israel. Did Israel announce opening extra uh, um, entry points, which they still haven't done, as we heard uh, from Shana? So to answer your question, Leila, very clearly, Germany must stop sending weapons. It is a legal obligation, and that is clear political leverage. We have a, we have we have the legal and institutional uh, framework is present, and we have a clear example with President Biden. If Germany is serious about Palestinian lives, that's what they must do. Otherwise, it's all talk and it's all performance. Luisa, would you like to respond to this or anything else that has been said? I have to say it's <laughs> extremely difficult for me to actually oversee what weapons have been sent. I try to follow the proceedings uh, uh, at the International Court of Justice now and read different reports by CIPRI, also in the local newspapers and so forth. And I, f to me, I have to say, I'm not really an expert on, on, on yeah. weapons uh, deliveries or whatever. And it was really difficult for me to actually get the numbers straight. Uh, there are reports that say it's 47% of all weapons deliveries to Israel. That was a report by CIPRI and others. A recent report by um, the German uh, Ministry of Economy says it has become much less. So for me, at the moment, I have to say um, it's very, very difficult for me now to frame this here uh, because I, I don't um, fully grasp um, uh, what the numbers are. Luisa, I don't know if you want to comment on this or give any other final comment before we go to the Yeah, well, it is, it is really complicated because there have been uh, raised so many questions and, uh, of course, um, uh, positions. So um, when it comes to um, weapon deliveries, and let me just say that I find it um, uh, good that we are having this debate because uh, this also means, and I mean, we as a government, we have to reflect on that. And I think we can clearly say that uh, uh, this also happened. And um, we uh, stated this in front of the courts that 98 percent of German licenses granted um, did not concern war weapons. And I think um, only, I can't um, uh, put in so much uh, numbers here since this is also, of course, a security issue, but this has been said in front of the courts, so a uh, uh, um, uh, valid point um, to uh, to uh, um, make this point. Um, and it is necessary, of course, to reflect on this in every context that includes war and um, uh, these situations. So uh, this is why we have, and it's complicated to explain, but we, of course, have um, security um, um, councils to say, I'm missing the word, the, the English term for <laughs> our um, uh, um, institutions. Um, but uh, uh, this has always been um, reflected and uh, put into the situation that we are facing at the moment. And um, I think uh, the number of uh, 98% um, uh, is uh, very important to mention here at this point. Um, 
But let me also, because this has also been uh, raised as questions, what we are doing um, and that it's not enough and that we don't push, put every pressure we have. It is a strategy that we, of course, um, address the Israeli side, also the Palestinian. Uh, and let me say this, that we, of course, welcome the steps taken by the um, PA um, to um, uh, try to be um uh, prepared for taking over responsibility. This is also a part of the negotiations and uh, the the uh, debates we are having with our um, uh, with the Palestinian side, but also, of course, um, the what we are expecting from the Israeli government. I also um, already mentioned this, but um, of course, being um, uh, in debates with uh, other states, for example, the Arab states or Qatar. Um, Egypt, which is also playing a crucial role. So this is what we are trying to do, to open up every way possible to negotiate. Um, and um, this also means that we are not only talking to the Israeli government. Um, uh, Rini, you mentioned that this is not uh, the only voice and political positioning we hear from Israel. That is totally true. And I traveled there myself uh, and met nearly, I, I hope, uh, <laughs> most uh, of uh, um, uh, the um, uh, Israeli society that is working for human rights rights for Palestinian people imprisoned, uh, for example, or um, who are really trying to, to um, uh, build uh, trust uh, to work um, further on a two-state solution. So, um, And I would also agree that we don't hear or listen to these voices enough. Um, this is due to a situation that also in, in Israel, uh, the civil society is facing shrinking spaces. That is absolutely clear, I think. But when it comes to the debate um, and how, you know, how honest it is, one has also to mention that Gaza and the dire humanitarian situation is, of course, most pressuring. And this is why we are all focusing on it. But there is still um, a very worrying situation in the West Bank going on. Um, and the foreign minister also addressed that multiple times very clearly, I would say, um, in the most clear way that these um, that the settlement or settlers' violence and the settlement policy is illegal um, uh, due to international and Israeli law. And it is also part of the, um, the bigger picture that we have to look closely on, that there are also people dying, that there is violence going on, and that the situation is dramatically um, uh, putting pressure on, on the go-to to, uh, two-state solution. So um, <laughs> only because... Um, I can not answer to all um, uh, criticism here, but I think the bigger picture and really seeking for a two-state solution includes the West Bank and the humanitarian situation in Gaza, but also civil society and Palestinian or Arab minority in Israel. And this is also what we as a government um, uh, um, are seeking and um, lobbying for, to put it like this. Uh, um, René, can you I would just like to give the audience some justice. <laughs> um, there's a question that says much of the criticism for the German position has been directed towards the German foreign office. What about the chancellor's role as well as the broader government? Is there somebody who can respond to this? Probably René or Luise. Weapons deliveries, for example, are also very much... Um, in the hands of the chancellor, for example. If you don't want to answer, I'm going well, to go. Yeah. I can answer very quickly. Um, of course, we can differentiate between the different uh, branches of the government. And, and I'll say the, um, this person said this and this per person said that at that point. But I mean, in the end, it is the German government that is coming to its decisions. And, and this is what has been criticized here. And I think rightly so. And in, um, of course, it's not the foreign minister alone, for sure. Um, as we know, in our political um, system, the, the chancellor has, uh, let's say, the loudest voice. And uh, yes, it has not been enough. And that's exactly what I talked about when I talked about leverage, because that's also in the chancellery. And uh, I haven't heard much here uh, also on the trips to the region. So uh, yes, um, it would be urgently needed that the chancellery moves ahead as well. Coming back to 
the aid supplies. Um, there's a question, is there any evidence that Hamas is de deliberately appropriating and stealing aid supplies? And who is behind the looting of the convoys? Organized gangs or desperate individuals? I think, Shana, you could probably respond yeah, to that. So I can speak to that. So there really hasn't been significant evidence of aid diversion by Hamas. And even today, David Satterfield, who's the humanitarian envoy from the United States, said that. Um, in terms of the challenges in delivering aid um, and, and looting, I think there's a few things that have happened. So first of all, there's just overall a general level of, of extreme desperation in Gaza that's leading to, to chaos and leading to degradation of, of civil uh, civil order there. That's been compounded by the fact that Israel has repeatedly targeted uh, uh, Palestinian police officers who are civil servants. They aren't part of the Hamas military wing. Many of these police officers are actually affiliated with Fatah or unaffiliated. Um, and those police officers were accompanying aid convoys and protecting the aid and ensuring that it was going to the distribution points they were intended to and, and reaching people in need. After Israel targeted uh, police officers, and I, I, as of a month or two ago, at least nine police officers had been killed in the process or immediately after accompanying aid, the police said that they were unwilling to escort aid convoys. So that led to a, another level of insecurity for aid workers. And so what we've seen are two things. There's individuals who are self, what I would call self-serving and they see convoys going by, they might be jumping on those trucks and taking the aid for themselves because they desperately need it. And then there have been some criminal elements that there's no evidence that these are, are gangs that are associated with Hamas or any other armed wing. They appear to be uh, primarily cr just criminal in nature that are doing more violent uh, looting and stealing of, of aid. And then that aid is ending up being sold at, at extreme prices on, on the black market in Gaza. Um, and so, of course, the, the lack of police officers is one of the major things that is leading to this degradation of, of civil order. And then, of course, it makes aid agencies more reluctant to do distributions. The level of desperation increases. And we see that it's 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 snowballs where uh, that makes it even more insecure for humanitarians to to work as people get more desperate and so on and so forth. So those are some of the issues related to to um, aid being aid being taken sometimes by just desperate individuals and sometimes as we've seen with these more criminal gangs that are that are um, much more violent and and actually have have targeted um, convoy truck drivers and and things like that. Thank you. Maybe related uh, to that also a question on attack on the aid workers. Um, are the shooting attacks on aid trucks referred to by Michael reported and documented anywhere with the numbers of trucks and date, time and place? As law and order has broken down in Gaza, who could protect the humanitarian convoys? Um, the ICG calls for civilian authorities to secure the distribution. Who could take on this role? Michael, can you respond to that? I'll, yeah, I mean, I'll do my best. So, I mean, you can look in many UN reports. So, I mean, each time a convoy is, is attacked, it's being documented by different organizations. But if you want sort of the most conservative number that's already outdated, the UN High Commissioner put out a report about a month ago now. And at that time, this was around the time of the flower, the so-called flower massacre. Right before that flower massacre, the report came out by the High Commissioner. And at that point, they they had reported 14 attacks against convoys. So that was a while ago. So we know that the number is increasing. The other challenge is that reporters are denied access into Gaza, and that was also on purpose. So part of the challenge, why a lot of people have to rely on satellite data or what what organizations are available uh, on the ground, is is Israel denying reporters access, denying colleagues. So other special reporters have tried to go to Gaza. Israel um, and its allies have blocked the commission of inquiry from the Human Rights Council on Palestine, on Palestinian territory. So there's all these mechanisms that can allow people to have more direct access and they're being actively blocked. So the short answer is yes, it's being recorded. Yes, those, those that information is available. Um, and nevertheless, um, 
Israel and its allies are making it as difficult as possible to continue to get uh, uh, information in real time. If I can just add a, a couple of things uh, to that is one that CNN just in the last couple of days released uh, an in-depth reporting that they did on the flower massacre, uh, undermining the Israeli narrative, co co contradicting the Israeli narrative about the timeline there and demonstrating that Israel fired upon um, aid seekers even prior to the convoy, the time that Israel said that the convoys um, crossed from southern to northern Gaza. And then the second thing that I just want to, to maybe qualify Michael's remarks is that it's important to note that Israel has denied foreign journalists access to Gaza, but there still are very brave Gazan reporters who are there continuing to report to the best of their knowledge um, and abilities. And so while access for, for foreign journalists has been strictly limited, to embeds with the Israeli military, there still are people, human rights, local human rights organizations, uh, humanitarians, and then independent journalists or just local journalists working for international agencies that continue to, to report on what's happening in Gaza. Shaina, there's a question to you. Could you please repeat the numbers about the food aid needed and currently supplied? Sure. So, uh, so based on based on the population estimates, there would need to be a requirement uh, based on Israeli calculations of three thousand nine hundred and eighty four point six tons of food daily. And at best, Israel has provided approximately forty point three four percent of that required um, daily food for the last one hundred and eighty six days. That also should be noted that when Israel made those calculations in 2008, uh, estimating the amount of calories that were needed, Gaza still had, um, was producing food locally. You know, there's farmland there, uh, agricultural land, there was uh, local, you know, sheep and goat herds and chickens, and much of that food supply that was being produced internally has disappeared. So this estimate of the amount that would need to be required um, daily is much less, is, it's not taking into account the fact that Gaza's food production has largely been eliminated at this point. And so um, in terms of yesterday, Israel trans inspected and transferred 3,885 tons of food, which is still 100 tons short of the minimum required amount. And yesterday was a high point in terms of the amount of aid getting in. Leila, I think that you're muted, so we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, another question to you, Shana. What is the place, name, location of the military crossing that has been mentioned? I think that's the one that you mentioned um, in the north. Yeah, so this is the, it's called Gate 96. Um, and it's right around the area of Wadi Gaza, of the Wadi Gaza divide. And this is a road that's been built. There's a, it's, it's the entry point for a road that's been built since October 7th by the Israeli military and has been used primarily as a supply route for the Israeli military and also has been used to divide, uh, to create this barrier dividing North and South Gaza. There's a question to Michael. Do you see a similar but slower process in the West Bank about 150,000 workers no longer making money in Israel? 50% of the olives not harvested in 2023, increase of checkpoints and blocking communities off, etc. Yeah, I mean, that question really highlights what's at stake here. So by focusing on food, this is, and again, to go back to the topic of our, of our event today, by focusing on food, you immediately understand what's going on and what's at stake. So even before the war started, there was record number of settler violence and, and IDF-supported uh, violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. And so what we're seeing, record violence, and that included 
attacks against peasants and small farmers and denying them the ability to harvest olives this year. What's at stake with olives? So, of course, olives are a source of food and livelihood. But the olive tree is a core aspect of what it means to be Palestinian. Olives live for, olive trees live for hundreds of years. So denying Palestinians access to harvest olives is denying Palestinians their relationship with their ancestors, with their land, and with their future. Let me add one more dynamic. The UNRWA situation. So again, food allows us to look broadly. So it's not just a war in Gaza. This is a war against Palestinians. So yes, we have the war in Gaza and starvation, which Israel, again, announced its starvation campaign. Not only do we have record degree of violence in the West Bank and denial of, 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 of peasants to, to, the, to their olive trees, we also then have the attack against UNRWA, which we've, we've talked about. But let's put this in context. There was... Uh, unfounded allegations made by Israel, which then major donors immediately said, oh, we're going to stop um, funding. That's punishing Palestinian refugees in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, the West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza uh, almost immediately, putting also putting their situation of food security, making it very precarious. So what we have is a war in Gaza. We have a tax, uh, record uh, degrees of violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. And we have an attack against UNRWA, which is an attack against uh, refugees. And again, this was unsupported allegations against nine employees amongst 30,000 employees. This was not a rational response by the funders. So what we have by looking at food, we understand this is a, this is a campaign against the Palestinian people as such, as Palestinian, uh, simply for being Palestinian. And if I might just add a little bit about the West Bank context, because we at NRC um, lead the West Bank Protection Consortium, which works to help um, Palestinians living in Area C, the vast majority of, of territory in the West Bank, stay where they are. Just a few things that we've been noticing even prior to October 7th, as Michael was mentioning. So we've seen the increase of uh, Israeli settler herder farms cropping up around the West Bank. Um, and that means that that Palestinian shepherds, uh, Bedouin communities, communities that rely on herding are unable to access their lands. It's a cheap and easy way for Israelis to take over vast amounts of productive land um, and deny Palestinians access to it. Many of the communities that we support are now reliant on animal fodder. And we, for the first time ever, have, have been providing that type of humanitarian assistance to these communities. But it's extremely expensive and, and unsustainable. Um, additionally, Palestinians are restricted from um, the largely restricted from the Jordan Valley, which is the breadbasket of the West Bank, at, where they're unable to cultivate. And then finally, I just want to plug some research that NRC just completed and released in the last month uh, about uh, untreated settlement wastewater being. Um, being discharged onto Palestinian agricultural lands. And we worked with a local Palestinian um, agency, the Land Research Center, which conducted lab analysis and testing of soil, water, and plant life in two sites in the north of the West Bank, where industrial waste was being expelled onto olive groves, and also uh, in the south of the West Bank, where untreated human waste water was being expelled onto Palestinian vineyards that was um, destroying the crops, leading to, to um, invasive species taking over the land. People were having, farmers were having difficulties even selling their crops because nobody wants to purchase grapes that have been grown in, in human sewage. Um, and, and of course, there's long-term uh, effects on the soil and productivity of this land. And, and this is, we looked at two cases, but there are many sites around the West Bank where the land is being destroyed, and this is preventing Palestinians from continuing to engage, as Michael said, in their traditional agrarian ways. And it's also a means of that will lead if Palestinians are forced to abandon their land to further Israeli settlement takeover. And this is happening all throughout Area C of the West Bank, which is essential for the two-state solution, which Germany and the whole international community purport to continue to support. So this is something that we should not be uh, ignoring uh, moving forward as well. Thank you, Shayna. Luisa? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, because I forgot earlier to uh, mention UNRWA, and of course, uh, it is important to raise these questions. And for me, um, and I said this before, uh, we have had a lot of debates about the humanitarian assistance and who to uh, support which organization to distribute um, the funding. And maybe this is also my, my uh, obligation as a politician to just mention, if there is allegations like this, a parliament, of course, has the right to reflect on this and ask the government to act accordingly uh, and respect German funding and uh, the regulations we have. So um, what must be said, and I support this, that uh, we have to take the allegations seriously. That is also due to future funding and, of course, the whole international system we are working in, that we don't take this uh, lightly and uh, that we um, uh, are, have the obligation to um, to evaluate, and this is what the UN is doing at the moment, and we are waiting for the final report, of course, um, and we tried as a government to um, to uh, make it possible that funding and humanitarian assistance will still be um, uh, able to access the Gaza Strip via working with other NGOs, uh, of course, um, continuing uh, UNRWA and the support in the West Bank and other Arab states, and uh, there will be a decision on uh, UNRWA uh, in, uh, in Gaza, uh, alongside with our partners, um, hopefully soon, since uh, this is a situation that um, can't stay like this, of course, we need a decision on that. Um, otherwise, it's the elephant in the room and or an allegation that is not proved is never good for a political debate and process. Uh, you will understand that. But of course, the government and also the parliament has the right to, to reflect and ask questions and uh, make sure that funding is not going into um, uh, wrong directions. But this doesn't necessarily mean that this situation we are in now will stay like this. So there must be a decision and hopefully so soon. Um, but this um, didn't hinder us to um, stay engaged uh, in, in the most possible way to um, support the civilians in Gaza uh, with humanitarian assistance as much as we can. And hopefully um, uh, the parliament alongside with the government will um, stay committed. So this is um, the situation on UNRWA. I know, of course, about the work of UNRWA in uh, various contexts. Um, and I think without UNRWA, and this is my uh, um, uh, view on the situation that is um, also, of course, um, uh, a result of a lot of conversations with people on the ground, um, UNRWA is providing, and this provision is, you can't take it away. It will uh, um, make uh, this place, make Gaza uh, even more um, critical. So uh, to replace UNRWA or to reform UNRWA, does, that these points are important to discuss. But still, we need to provide for the people in this very moment. So this is the sensible situation we are in right now. But of course, UNRWA can't be, and this is uh, being said by the government multiple times, can't be replaced in a minute but we need it now. So this is the situation and I hope that we will come to um, uh, um, a final report and decision very soon um, because the situation, uh, we have talked about this the whole time, um, uh, can't yeah, accept uh, more humanitarian assistance to be uh, questioned or um, left aside. So. There are a lot of questions in the chat that I'm afraid we won't be able to, to address. There are also a lot of questions on uh, the current political climate in Germany about progressive Arab people who stood up against their own repressive regimes, came to Germany uh, and now feel disappointed here. Uh, there is also a point about... Um, wouldn't be the best leverage by the German government to actively work against the silent silencing of Israel's critics in Germany to allow the memory culture to be revisited and enable a space where citizens can actually feel free to express uh, empathy without being um, called uh, cancelled or called um, anti-Semites and so forth. I'm afraid that this is a huge topic that we need another platform for. It's definitely something that needs to be discussed uh, in depth in Germany uh, in many uh, different occasions. Um, I'm afraid we can't do it here. René, you have a last point. Please make it very brief. 
Well, maybe I can answer the last question. I would just answer it with, yes, we should revisit the memory culture and open up the space and have more empathy. And before, I just wanted to underline that we have to, while we're discussing the dramatic situation in Gaza, indeed, we have to look at the West Bank. You asked about blind spots before. I think it has been dramatic what has been happening there. Uh, more than 400 Palestinians uh, have been killed, more than 5,000 uh, injured. And just one last point on funding. Um, Louisa now discussed UNRWA, but uh, I think we also should talk about the uh, Palestinian and Israeli human rights um, community. And uh, if we, one would think that this is the moment where we support Palestinian democratic actors and the human rights community, but they are under the same uh, difficult constraints as UNRWA. They're being cut off. I just talked to a colleague from P PCHR, Palestinian Center of Human Rights, uh, yesterday. It's incredible that they are still continuing with their work after six uh, months of uh, being under attack. And these people have been criticizing Hamas as they have been criticizing the Israeli government before. Uh, so many brave people that support our, uh, deserve our support. Uh, and um, I think this is something that needs to be highlighted and uh, that we hopefully will, will see as well. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time now. Thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, thank you very much to the audience. I think the urgency has reflected in the pace of the discussion, also in the pace of the questions that came in. Um, I don't have time to, to wrap up, really. Uh, maybe just express solidarity to um, the civilian population of Gaza that is... Um, suffering from the famine and suffering from the ongoing war, solidarity to the to the hostages and their families, civilians on, I guess, on all sides of, of conflicts. And as René mentioned, also uh, a lot of solidarity to the humanitarian organizations, of course, but also to human rights actors, women's rights actors, all those progressive forces. They're really trying uh, their best to keep up democratic values, human rights and um, yeah, hopefully come to an end of this uh, terrible war. Thank you very much. And thanks to the audience. And I hope for other occasions that we can, can, can continue these important conversations. Good evening to you all. Thank you, Laila. Thank you, Laila. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.